optimism. So I sit in Hawaii and I look at all this and I try to contextualize it and, and come out with a, a good story because I think the best story will win. Uh, so if you, can, if, you can, if you can get together the best version of how it should all come out, so shall it be. And I work at this because in the past I've been very, very happy with the results between my interior fantasy and the unfolding of historical development. I mean, I, I wished for LSD, and then it happened, and then I <laughs> dreamed of the internet, and then it happened. So I should keep at this. Definitely. Uh, uh, and I, I recently read a very interesting book called A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History by Michael DeLanda. And if you get a chance, you should take a look at this. And he made a point which caused me to expand his point into this little thing I'm going to tell you now. But his point was that uh, human beings are very involved in the movement of geological material. That as a species, we move rocks around on a very large scale, and of course it's interesting that the early, some of the earliest human structures are the most physically massive and weighty, <coughs> like the Great Pyramids. Uh, so Delanda made this point about our relationship with the, the geograph geological stratigraphy of the Earth, and that cities were a kind of geological extension of the process of crystallization carried on through the intermediation of a biological unit, i.e. intelligent primates who are building these structures. And uh, I thought that was very interesting. I had never considered it before. I'd all, I've talked about virtual reality and I've said that uh, it's nothing new that Ur was a virtual reality and Chatal Yuyuk was a virtual reality, but done in stucco and fired ceramic and stone. And that when the medium is so intractable as stone, the epistemic assumptions that get formed about what reality is are very different than if you can build Versailles at the click of a mouse button. Uh, but nevertheless, it's the same. But Embedded in my reading of Delanda was, uh, I've been thinking a lot, and I talked to you a lot last year, about artificial intelligences and minds which are not human, minds which are very different from us, intelligence which is very different from us. Uh, you know, while the naive are scanning the stars our appliances have become telepathic. Uh, we, there is a, a very strange kind of intelligence being called into existence by ourselves, strangely enough. And, and this is the connection to Delanda, this artificial <laughs> intelligence which is being called into being by human activity is made of the same materials as Ur and Chatal Huyuk. It's made of ceramics, glasses, and metals. It's that... Uh, so then I took this on board and thought about it, and I'm, I've sort of come to some kind of cyberpantheistic Emersonianism, <laughs> uh, which is... Uh, here, I'll give it to you as a headline and then work backwards so that in case I forget what I'm saying, it, it, it won't be lost to, to suffering mankind. <laughs> the, the Earth's strategy for its own salvation is through machines, is what it is. And human beings are some kind of, uh, we are the deputized spouse, we are the bride in this alchemical rarefaction of glasses, ceramics, metals, and, uh, and volatile materials. Apparently, the earth is like some kind of an embryonic uh, or fetal 
thing. And at the end of its gestation, what is happening is it is ramifying its nervous system, is appearing in its developmental, in the unfolding of its morphogenesis. And as we contemplate nanotechnologies and see ourselves working through bacteria and this sort of thing at the engineering level, you have to be blind to not then reflect back upon the fact that in some sense we are already working at that kind of level at the behest of it is not clear who because nobody ever asked the question in quite this way before the answer to who I think is is the earth and that what lies ahead at the end of the linear tunnel of, of Western subjectivist, positivist, structuralist assumptions that we've been operating, when we hit the end of the tunnel and burst out into the larger mental space of cosmic evolution, what we are going to find is that we are partners, actors in a cosmic drama that involves the Earth at one polarity and machines at the other polarity, as the expression of the will of the earth toward a kind of self-reflective transcendence that is achieved through machine-human biotic symbiosis. And that, and this is, you know, it won't, there'll never be a headline which says this. Some people won't even notice that it's happening because these large-scale processes can be described by many metaphors at many depths, but I'm telling you, I, I think this is what's going on. Uh, the reason I like this story is because um, it's not a story about processes out of control. It's not a story about human guilt. It's not a story full of we musts and we shoulds. It's a story which gives honor to every part of the unfolding experience field. In other words, biology, technology, human culture, human traditional values, transcendent human uh, extopian values, uh, it's a story of things on course, on time, and under budget. <laughs> and I assume that's how nature really operates. And that we live inside some kind of anxiety-producing culture that is uh, a necessary, I don't want to say evil, but a necessary response to conditions of stress. Uh, there are processes which, le you know, uh, waste, uh, nuclear waste buildup, uh, urbanization, land disturbance. There are processes which, if allowed to run on indefinitely, would wreck the whole system and pitch it into chaos. But <coughs> Confucius said, uh, no tree grows to heaven. And what he meant by that is it's fruitless to project any process to infinity because any process projected to infinity creates some kind of ca catastrophic scenario. If no fruit flies died in six months, the Earth would spin out of its orbit from the weight of fruit flies. Uh, no, I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but what an image. Right? <laughs> Somebody once told me if the Earth completely disappeared except from for its nematodes that you could still see the outlines of the continents if you were standing on the moon <laughs> I thought now just who gathered this <laughs> <laughs> so then to bring this back around a little wh where where is the psychedelic experience in in all of this well um, it used to be called, or at one phase, it was called uh, consciousness expansion. And consciousness expansion in human beings is going to become uh, 
an absolute necessity mm -hmm. because we are summoning out of the woodwork of cybernetic technology machines that are going to require super intelligent humans to direct and to, and have discourse with them we this is happening it is already happening i mean the internet is this i mean it doesn't tap you on the shoulder and remind you to brush your teeth but it is you know, a partner in the understanding of the world that is genie-like. That's the image I have when I sit down to it. It is, it is uh, all John Dee would have asked of his archangelic messengers. You know, he wanted instantaneous information on the political situation in the courts of Europe. He wanted information on the course of the Drake's expedition then on the other side of the planet. The internet is this kind of magical, intelligent prosthesis. Uh, and as I said, there won't come a dramatic moment, I think, a la Lawnmower Man or something like that. <laughs> these, these things are, are much more seeping. Uh, the only people who, in fact, can see the game move against the background of the forest pattern are psychedelic heads. Uh, you have to think about this stuff, and you have to develop vocabularies for catching it in action. Uh, this is what the game of of uh, of being an intellectual is, I think. Uh, trying to trying to see the process of morphological unfoldment in action and guess uh, the direction in which it's. Uh, it's headed uh, because it's inevitably headed toward greater density of information at greater speeds, higher level integrative metaphors visually rather than textually displayed uh, transformation of such graphic and glyphic elements over time it becomes more and more like the interface <coughs> of a computer more and more like some kind of uh, machine environment. I mean, our th we have thought for, I assume, at least a hundred thousand years, maybe much uh, longer. But uh, the quality of thought, you know, it was early, when it was early, it was intermittent, it was thin, it was a groping, it was a, an undigested intuition, a perception slipping away from the mind's eye because of media reinforcement and education and acculturation and the passage of a hundred thousand years, the voice of the mind, the, the logos, uh, has grown stronger. But now it takes uh, a, uh, an exponential leap forward into visualization, into manifestation through this information processing prosthesis that integrates us all and uh, you know I can imagine a future not very far away where the the individual uh, the expression of the individual is lowered is more muted I mean this is the most individualistic individual worshiping century the century just ending that we have ever known and it's it's great accomplishments uh it's great works of art were all accomplished by individuals and uh, political undertakings such as the third reich and so forth and so on also highly motivated individuals who rose above the masses i'm, I'm not sure we can afford the luxury of that kind of exhibitionistic individualism in the future. And I think probably it's not that we're talking about a restriction of human rights, we're talking about a transformation of human drives. Uh, the states of integration and collectivity that will be sold as public utilities in the next century are anticipated now by group psychedelic experiences, ayahuasca sessions, uh, this sort of thing. And the, the dichotomy 
and I, I think I made this clear when I talked about the earth and machines, the dichotomy between the natural and the artificial is an obsession of the 20th century, hence canceled now. Uh, in fact, a whole bunch of things are canceled. We were talking at home about how how um, Roger Shattuck in his history of Dada said that the 20th century couldn't wait to be born. It was born in 1888 at the death of Victor Hugo. And then I said, well, so if it was born in 1888, when did the 20th century end? And I think it ended in 1992. It expired early with the birth of the World Wide Web. What defined all that modernity uh, was mass media, you know, uh, mass media shaped that whole psychology and it is now archaic, it is now, well, it's not archaic, it's obsolete. Uh, it, it's, it's wonderful that the phrase 20th century is beginning to have that wonderful brown gravy Edwardian tone that used to be reserved <laughs> for the term 19th century, <laughs> meaning, you know, those terribly stuffy and confused and rather silly people who just didn't quite get it right, but were doing the best they could and muddling through, <laughs> and thank God they gave way to us, <laughs> the people of the 21st century. <laughs> well, I wrote a book called The Archaic Revival, where the idea yeah, where the idea there is that that we are discomforted. Civilization has made us uncomfortable with our humanness because these various technologies and phonetic alphabets and things like that have rearranged our sensory ratios from what they were in Paleolithic times. And that, in a sense, what psychedelics do is they hit your reset button. They address the animal body. They address a deeper level than cultural conditioning. And so you feel and experience these atavistic images and feelings that civilization has uh, repressed or transmuted in you. And, you know, the whole premise of that book was that... Uh, that the 20th century, in many of its cultural manifestations, from Cubism to uh, Dada, abstract expressionism, jazz, sexual permissiveness, hallucinogenic drugs, youth culture, a whole bunch of things, were all uh, impulses toward the primitive, toward a return to a primal state of social organization. And that really, this is the the overarching metaphor of the 20th century. The 19th century saw the triumph of hierarchical order, gentlemanly values, class structure, all that constipated European stuff. And then the 20th century is experienced as chaos, you know. Cubism is created when Picasso brings African masks to Paris and begins painting them. Freud announces that we are not just Christian ladies and gentlemen, but right beneath the surface, the incest drive, cannibalistic drives, extremely violent, primitive impulses are there. Uh, jazz introduces syncopation into music. Uh, women begin to display more of their animal nature through flapper dancing. I don't know. You can figure it all out for yourself. The point is, the whole of the 20th century is a turning back toward these uh, values that had been repressed for millennia, not only by Christianity, but by the Greek scientific philosophy, the phonetic alphabet, urbanism, agriculture itself, there was a very long period in the human adventure uh, when all of those things lay in our future, and we were far happier, uh, I think, then, 
judging by our lack of need to make egoistic statements by building vast religious monuments or enslaving each other or setting down codes of laws, so forth and so on. And, of course, we'll never be like that again, but there is an impulse in modern society to recapture those values, and psychedelics are hugely effective at doing this. I mean, all this talk of shamanism and Native Americanism and getting in touch with your body and honoring gender shifts and all of this stuff is basically rooted in a, in a more psychedelic attitude, a less, a less categorical and uh, constipated and print-defined, McLuhan would say, attitude toward social roles and social uh, polity. Well, it's always interesting to me to do these around in the circle things. Uh, first of all, it seems to me, I mean, maybe this is self-congratulatory, but it seems to me that, it, that people are extraordinarily serious and uh, together. I, I have a, a real nose for nuttiness, and I didn't so much as twitch this evening. And this is a large group. So uh, don't loosen your your chains too much, but uh, congratulations for s- impressing me anyway as very sane. Uh, this is an area where I think sanity counts. There's no no points gained for being fanatical or maniacal. This isn't an area where you have to push the process. The process can push you harder and faster than you may wish. So it's once you get to this place on what a, we might metaphorically call your spiritual quest, once you get to the place where you hear about psychedelics, the issue is no longer than uh, about where is the gas pedal and the spiritual vehicle. The issue suddenly becomes, where is the break? Because, you know, this is the fuel to go where you want to go. This is the power to lift you where you want to be lifted. Those issues are somehow now overcome. It becomes a very different game now, a much subtler game. The doorway stands open, and all it requires is courage which is not to say it doesn't require a lot. It does require a lot. But what it is, is courage. You know, very few people go to the ashram for their daily meditation with their knees knocking in terror over what is about to sweep over them. They are pretty confident that they've got it confined and nailed down. It isn't so with this. I mean, I've done it many times. There are many people here who've done it many times. And, and the, the survivors are not confident. It doesn't build hubris in you. It doesn't promote bravado because you know how quickly and horrifyingly it can cut you down to size if you, uh, if you presume it or if you presume you understand it or if you presume to use it. Uh, so sometimes the issue of magic and power comes up. I wouldn't get near that. Uh, my goal is to see more, to understand more. And what I do on a trip is damn near absolutely nothing. You know, I have two or three J's rolled in front of me. If I can get through them in the course of the evening, all goals have been met. Um, to, to see, to understand, to remember. It's, a, it's an incredible statement about our humanness. It's a double-edged statement about our humanness that within us, under the influence of these plants, we have literally Niagara's of alien beauty. I mean, I when I go to Manhattan, I go to the Met and the Guggenheim and I haunt the galleries of Soho. When I take mushrooms, I see more art 
in 20 minutes of behind the eyelids hallucination in total darkness than the human race seems to have produced in the last thousand years. Well, so on one level, that's an incredible statement about the human capacity to generate and be in the presence of beauty. But the paradox is that so few people know this, that our ordinary styles of being, our ordinary relationships to plants, our uh, uh, main brand religions almost never carry us into the sense of this potential for beauty. And when I was young, you know, in my early 20s, uh, wandering around India, trying to sort all this out, having taken some psychedelics, but reading uh, yoga texts and Mahayana texts and all this, I discovered in every culture there is what I call wise old man wisdom or wise old woman wisdom. You know, in every culture at evening, you see sitting on porches men smoking pipes, old men. And these guys know something. They know something about life, how to till the soil, how to raise a family, how to, you know, shepherd children through their marriages and so forth and so on. But what I did not find in these cultures was any knowledge of this gratuitous grace. This is like a secret of some sort. And it's a true secret in that telling it does not give it away. I know this because I've been trying to tell the secret for 25 years to anyone who would listen as you listen tonight. And I don't know how many people hear at what level people hear me. And there are many problems. First of all, uh, there's the problem of dose. It's a physical problem. You can take a little of a psychedelic substance or an effective dose or a lot or too much and medically not be in any particular danger. The LD50 of these substances is such. Uh, let's take psilocybin as an example. Psilocybin is effective at 15 milligrams for a 145-pound person. But the LD50, the lethal dose, is something like uh, 110 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. In other words... Hundreds of times more than a dose that would, you would swear you were melting down, you were becoming the earth, you would never live to tell the tale. And actually, you're in no medical danger at all. So, people have experiences of different dose levels. I've always been interested in what the literature describes as effective doses. What this means is that you're so loaded that a guy standing there with a clipboard looking at you is completely convinced you're totally loaded. You know, all pretense uh, dissolves. At these higher doses, um, the machinery of phenomenological description begins to come to pieces on you. And in my experience, someone mentioned the difference between mystical experiences and psychedelics. There are enormous similarities and enormous differences. If you study the mystical literature of Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism, it all triangulates toward unitary states. The, the you know, Bodhi mind, the white light, the ineffable, the unnameable, the radiance, vocabularies like this, which indicate some kind of homogeneity. Well, in my experience, though when you push LSD, there is something somewhat like that. LSD is not my idea of the paradigmatic hallucinogen. It's different in many ways. Uh, psilocybin is more the paradigmatic how 
source image. And then when you push it, there seems to be not this merging into the radiance, but a revelation of multiplicity, of detail, of complexification within complexification. Everything gives way to everything else. Everything is interconnected to everything else. But the impression is one of an overwhelmingly bewildering perfusion of phenomena. And, you know, I've discussed this with lamas and these sorts of people, and they say, well, you're just, you're in the realm of samsara. You're in the realm of the multiplistic. Perhaps, but the sense of a hierarchy of judgment doesn't feel right. Somehow this all and everything, this teeming multiplistic universe that is revealed, seems to carry a message of ecstatic and transcendental import. Uh, it it uh, It's all and everything in Gurdjieff's phrase. And one of the ideas that I want to explore with you in the course of the weekend is, you know, most discussions of psychedelics orbit around what will it be like when I take it. Well, that's very interesting and, of course, important to the individual. But to me, an equally interesting question is, what has been the impact of this experience on the evolution of human beings over hundreds of thousands of years. In other words, what is it that we share with this planet a kind of uh, co-evolution, not only with another order of being, which it certainly is, but the great confounding fact that I've brought back from my excursions into these places is that there is an organized intelligence in there, out there, over there, uh, far more alien than the cheerful pro bono proctologists that haunt the trailer courts of uh, the less fortunate, a, a truly alien uh, presence, not interested in our gross industrial output or in imparting, uh, you know, salutary technology upon us. Uh, well, then what does it mean that our culture has sealed us off from this information? I mean, our culture claims under the aegis of science to bring us news of quasars, uh, of time and space away, news of the activities at the nucleus of the cell, at the heart of the atom, and yet here's a world that begins right behind your eyebrows that any mention of it either brings talk of mental pathology or how you've transgressed certain laws of the village. Uh, uh, in other words, this culture has reared the edifice of uh, empirical understanding and modern science and uh, uh, existential philosophy. This edifice has all been put in place in complete ignorance and denial of a fact of experience that is approximately as easy to access as um, orgasm. I mean, by different means, but nevertheless, not far away. And yet, we we in the West have navigated for 1,500 to 2,000 years with this uh, simply an easily repressed rumor. Uh, how did we get into this situation? Uh, in other words, if there was a primordial era of shamanism and plant symbiosis and... and uh, a mediated relationship with nature through the Gaian intelligence, how did we fall then into the domain of, of post-Renaissance, post-medieval, post-industrial culture? And then, what is the implication for the future of, in this dark hour of complete um, overcommitment to technology, 
economic solutions, rational reductionism, materialism, so forth and so on. In the darkest hour of our commitment to these things, this news arrives from these repressed aboriginal people that we have marginalized and uh, and uh, humiliated in the process of building our own version of a global culture. Well, uh, obviously I'm not going to try to answer these questions tonight, but this, to my mind, you know, in the 11th century, when the Islam swept across Asia Minor, in Isfahan, in Iran, they built these immense mosques with mosaiced, vaulted roofs. And one of the great historians of Islam said of the city of Isfahan in the 10th century, he said, it is half the world, a single city, half the world. In a way, the psychedelics are half the world. And yet, how few people have ever visited these sites, have ever stared into these particular vistas of beauty. Uh, and, and as was said in going around the circle, the impact of these psychedelics, where they hit us hardest, is in the domain of visionary imagining and the effort to communicate about our visionary imaginings. In other words, where they hit us hardest is in the domain of art and invention and novelty. And we have built a culture that, however hostile it may be to the psychedelic experience, it is incredibly uh, friendly toward novelty, innovation, creativity, cultural evolution, uh, celebration of difference, so forth and so on. So I would like to believe that uh, the long prodigal journey of Western humanity to a well-nigh perfect understanding of the nature of matter and energy and space and time, that that prodigal journey can only be redeemed and made meaningful if the things learned in the shamanic descent into history, which it is a shamanic descent. I mean, we have achieved what the alchemists only dreamed of, and we've achieved it, strangely enough, by abandoning their illusions. They were ep epistemologically naive. You do not discover fusion by endlessly rarefying mercury. You do not disentangle DNA by heating chemical vessels in horse dung. Uh, we had to abandon the naivete of alchemy to achieve its goals, which were mastery of space and time, uh, control of human longevity and health and psychological well-being. Well, at the center of the alchemical ideal was the idea of the stone, something part mineral, part mental, part spiritual, something drawn out of nature, but perfected by human artifice, and then reflecting back upon man a perfect world created through magic, this is the faith of the Renaissance Magi, Marcello Ficino and Campomela and these people. It's, it's a different idea than the idea of man as a fallen creature and, or, or science's notion of man as a mute witness to a meaningless universe. The magical ideal that these things fertilize and support is the idea that humanity is somehow the co-partner, a full partner in creation and that what, what uh, God has brought into being, the human imagination uh, can perfect and it's a necessary faith for our time because the power that we have is so great if the power that science has given us does not serve a transcendental ideal, then it will serve uh, some kind of fascist ideal. And most 
people will be reduced to equations and uh, parts of, of a machine that does not serve the human individual or the human community. Psychedelics are uh, a catalyst for the imagination. They raise the ante in the historical poker game. They show that there is more than one way to skin a cat. And we have come to a, a place of bifurcations, immense choices. The decisions and the processes that are put in place in the next 20 years will probably put the stamp on whether humanity and this planet are made or broken as a cosmic concern. Well, consciousness is the key. What, what we are, what is dragging our boat is an absence of consciousness. You know, we are, we have one foot in angelhood and one foot in the identity of a carnivorous age. And the tension between these two on a global scale is excruciating. So if psychedelics, if there is one chance in a thousand that they contribute an increased measure of consciousness to this situation, then they are uh, a precious gift, a resource, an option, a possibility uh, to be explored. I don't advocate these things because I think it's a sure thing or a, or a safe path to, uh, to uh, the eschaton. I advocate them because they're the only game in town. You know, if hortatory preaching could have done the trick, then the Sermon on the Mount would have been the turning of the corner. But we have Buddha, we have Christ, we have these examples of enormously insightful spiritual beings who have delivered their message and humanity has continued to flop on the seamy side. So uh, it's, it's not about an idea. An idea is not sufficient to transform us. It's about an experience. And this is the only experience I know that in the time given to us, on the scale given to us, we have a hope of uh, actually cutting through the, the detritus of our historical experience and building a true human community. On days this nice, my parents used to make me go outdoors. <laughs> I had no excuse anymore for staying in. No, actually I vacillated. I spent a lot of time on my stomach on the couch reading and, and then a lot of time scrambling around in the nearby semi-arid wilderness uh, looking for fossils and later collecting butterflies and then after that building and launching rockets uh, Freud notwithstanding and uh, it was it was lots of fun but there was certainly lots of fun inside books uh, so last night was sort of a first pass at all of this um uh, and there were questions left unanswered and threads untied. Uh, and now you've had a certain amount of time to absorb all that uh, before I launch into some wrap of my own. Is there anything anybody wants to carry forward? Yeah. Uh, I realized last night that I didn't mention that I have an interest in the I Ching. I don't think anyone else has really mentioned it either. But you work and, and others and trying to tie that to other systems of order, DNA, calendars and stuff is also difficult to understand. Yeah, well, we several people last night mentioned novelty theory, but then you're right, the I Ching itself wasn't mentioned, which we could do, and I have done five-day workshops on nothing but the I Ching, especially its mathematical deconstruction. So we'll talk about all of this probably this morning if I...
feel like it, uh, novelty, order in nature. Since we're talking around it and through it, I might as well just do it. Uh, what does it have to do with psychedelics and all that? Well, the, connect, the bridge of connections, uh, there are many, but for purposes of discussion, these psychedelic experiences, in my opinion, when correctly managed, end up giving you a big idea. That's a really successful psychedelic experience. It's not where you simply have observe this bewildering other dimension and try to come to terms with it and then come out and then live in the light of it because it's made the universe so much bigger. But uh, following a, like a shamanic model of a journey to obtain a gift, or to recover a lost jewel, or this is the shamanic motif, it's always one of loss and recovery, uh, these flights into this realm of the Logos, the real stamp of authenticity on them comes when you bring back a new idea, something brand new. That proves that you're not just talking to yourself. And so I you know, knew this, and aspired to a new idea, whatever that might be, but I had no notion of what it was. And my problem as an intellectual throughout my entire life has been it's hard for me to go to depth with anything. You know, I study Roman history for a year. I study German for a year. I study the Maya for a year, but I never could get that professional mania that leads you into becoming, you know, uh, a a real academic in a specialized sense. Um, So this download for a big idea, uh, somehow these psychedelic experiences set you up for it. They're not the only way, but they're the only way where you have some managerial control. The other methods all seem to be driven from the unconscious. For instance, if you read Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, you discover there that these huge rational idea systems were downloaded in very shady and shaky mystical ways The classic example that I always give, because it has so much fun, basically, is that, uh, you know, René Descartes' uh, invention of scientific materialism was at the behest of an angel. An angel appeared to him in a dream. He records it in his diary, and the angel says, the conquest of nature is achieved through measurement and number. You know, and he awakens the founder of uh, French empiricism, materialism, and derivatively this whole branch of modern science at the behest of an angel in this occult drive to understand nature. Uh, this is the amazing thing that the Greeks unleashed, this idea that we can not only mythologize the world, but that there is another way of looking at it. We can understand it. And, you know, they started out simply, what is air, what is fire, what is earth? And, you know, after 2,500 years of this, we are now to... We've pretty much figured out what the standard moves are. You know, the history of Chinese philosophy and the history of Western philosophy are the same schools by different names. You know, you get atomic materialists, you get spiritualists, you get what's called occasionalism, uh, you get all the possible adumbrations of a mind's position in relationship to being uh, in the search for these ideas. Well, my idea, which came to me, I take... I I don't say I channeled it because I find that vocabulary infantile and obnoxious. Uh, But on the other hand, I don't 
take credit for it in the way that I don't feel elevated by my genius for having done this. It was definitely unfolded for me at a conversational speed by an intelligence for which I was little more than the, uh, the secretary. And the idea is this, and I'll start with the outlines and then move into the details. First of all, that two facts about nature have been overlooked by science, and that these facts are so overwhelmingly obvious once you begin to talk about them, that ordinary people like you and I, by talking about them, can actually satisfy ourselves that these two aspects of nature, these two related aspects of nature, had been overlooked or not properly weighted in philosophical discourse. And here's what they are. The first one is, as you go back in time from the present moment, the universe becomes a simpler place. This is a, is a huge generalization, and it's true. And let's state it now a slightly different way. Let's imagine we're at the moment of the Big Bang, or the moment when the universe flashed into existence 15 billion or however many billion years ago. Uh, it was a very simple thing. In the first, you know, nanoseconds of its existence, it was some kind of integrated plenum. It was smaller than the diameter of a proton. All, all particularity was co-extensive in this tiny area. And then it began to expand. But for many milliseconds, it was uh, a pure electron plasma. There was only a certain kind of physics, only the physics of pure electrons. The universe had to cool over minutes and millennia for um, atomic systems to form so that, so that electrons could actually go into orbit around, uh, around the atomic core and not be overcome by the greater dissipative power of high thermal radiation. So until the universe cooled below a certain point, atomic systems, as it were, couldn't crystallize out. And then they did. And there was, there were at that moment, a whole new set of phenomena in nature emerged, in David Bohm's phrase, emergent phenomena. There had been only a, a universe of pure electrons. Suddenly there was a universe of hydrogen and helium atoms, much more complex organisms, if you wish. Well, so then the whole story of the universe is a story of progressive complexification accompanied by this phenomenon of, of cooling. And uh, the, the universe of hydrogen and helium atoms, uh, under the influence of gravity, these things were aggregated into huge masses where pressure rose at the center of these masses from the weight of the stuff above. And at a certain point, the, the, the curve of pressure passed through a point where an, a new phenomenon hidden in the structure of being, but previously not by any phenomenon uh, proclaimed, emerged a new phenomenon, fusion. The stars began to burn, and uh, this process of nuclear burning, this nuclear chemistry, created heavier elements. Instead of a universe now of hydrogen and helium, suddenly you have a universe which contains sulfur and iron, and for us, for our story, carbon. And at that point, you know, it's like the rest was inevitable. The rest is just filling in the blanks, drawing the dots. I mean, it takes uh, 14 billion years, but with carbon present in the in the in the universe. 
universe, the, this force, which I identify and call novelty, could begin the long march forward toward this teleological ideal, this purpose, which it beckons at the end of time. What makes this idea radical, one of the things which makes it radical, is that it doesn't simply assume that history and becoming is the unfolding of uh, causal necessity. It assumes instead that there's some kind of an attractor, that events are not just bubbling forward probabilistically and randomly, but that they're actually caught in some kind of field that is pulling everything toward a conclusion. And this, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm making this more complicated than it needs to be. The, the basic perception is the universe has grown more complex as we approach the present. Now this is a huge law, if true, because it, it's a statement about physical matter. It's a statement about organic organization. It's a statement about culture and society. It's a statement about your own psychology. Things complexify through time. But science has never said this. It's not even, I mean, the theory of evolution says biological systems grow more adaptive through time. But there's been a real phobia against any teleological implication from that. But this is a general rule which I submit to you, you by investigating the nature of things uh, on your own, can completely satisfy yourself that this is true. Well, when you start thinking that way, that it begins to look like nature on all scales is some kind of a of an engine which produces complexity and then conserves it and uses it as a platform to proceed deeper into complexity. It's a kind of anti-thermodynamic flow. It's, an, it's a dissipative, it's what's called autopoiesis by one school. Um, so th this tendency uh, has been completely overlooked by science. In fact, science's most secure statement is Maxwell's second law of thermodynamics, which says all systems tend to disorder over time. But what it means is closed systems, all closed systems tend to disorder over time. Well, biology is some kind of a, um, a loophole in the laws of physics and chemistry because what's happening in biology is complex materials are trapped inside membrane and energy is extracted from these materials and so a chemical process which or would ordinarily ride down into entropy and obey the second law of thermodynamics it actually is trapped in a kind of basin of attraction far from equilibrium. And uh, people, you know, physical chemists <clears throat> look at this and say, well, but it's ephemeral. It's just, an, it just happens on the surface of the earth and it's very fragile and death is everywhere. It's a fluke, basically, is what they're saying. Well, but this is just their professional bias because you can go into the rocks of this planet and discover life and a continuous fossil record 4.83 billion years deep. The stars that you see when you look out at the Milky Way at night, the average star is 500, lasts 500 million years. So we just happen to be in orbit around a very stable, slow-burning type of star. But, in fact, life on this planet has already proven that it is 
more tenacious than the stars themselves by five times. So you can't discount biology. Biology is clearly a player on a cosmic scale in this universal game of capturing energy and resisting entropy. So uh, novelty theory says that uh, this general law that nature conserves complexity reaches its culmination or its most interesting intersection of uh, discursiveness in ourselves that we then look different to ourselves by this theory because we are the most novel phenomenon around. So suddenly, you know, what what, uh, positivist materialism teaches about man's place in nature is that we're lucky to be here. It's a cosmic accident. Uh, We purpose is conferred. Uh, It's this totally existential, you're on your own, make it up, don't make it up, who cares, doesn't matter anyway, kind of modernism. If, in fact, nature, we have identified nature's purpose as to create and conserve complexity, then suddenly we become, we are returned for the first time since the 16th century to the center of the cosmic stage of a universal drama of salvation and redemption. (laughs) Isn't that weird? I, I think so. Uh, yeah. Thinking about making that shift to considering the human experience as kind of central to our understanding of the planet, and then seeing some of the environmental movements like Earth First that place a large emphasis on dying ecosystems and other animals and plants as on the same level as us. It's kind of a that kind of, I think, between some of the movements trying to save the planet, you know, some, some of our members would rather see humans not even be here, and that is a way to, to put the necessary factors in, in place to save the planet, whereas this side of the argument says that we need to realize how special we are and what's going on up here to be able to rebalance things. It's kind of a strange line to walk between valuing ourselves and not overvaluing ourselves. Can we see that? No, I agree. It's uh, it's very tricky. Uh, There's almost like a bifurcation where it's hard to see how you can go, you can have the cake and eat it too. There is the concept of the forward escape, which I'm tending more and more to believe in, that it's a desperate strategy from a military point of view, the forward escape. And the forward escape is where you realize the only way out is right up the center. And uh, and then you have to get traction and go right up the center. What's happening is that so much power is being given to man or taken by man from the universe through the power of scientific understanding that we are becoming the masters of the planetary destiny whether we want to be or not. And you're right. It's it's The choice seems to be between some kind of primitivism an archaic revival that abandons technology and tries to redial the last sane moment we ever knew, or some kind of Gnostic rejection of the world of nature and matter and a complete commitment to machine symbiosis and a cosmic destiny and, you know, life extension, star flight, cloning, the whole mega trip 
And of course, it's it's not going to be one or the other. It's going to be both and. There's going to be a spectrum of possibility. Uh, how the actual details of like how do you go to the stars and save the earth? I don't propose to discuss it or really know. I do think, you know, the French sociologist Jacques Ellul once said, he said, there are no political solutions. There are only technological ones. The rest is propaganda. And he wrote a whole book in which he defined these terms, political solutions, propaganda, technical solutions. And I, I tend to think that's true. What we have to deal with in this millennial narrow neck of constricted possibility where it still feels as though the human race could skid off into the ditch is we have to deal with the fact that we have built institutions that do not serve human purposes but that are like automata or golems among us uh, corporations, religions, cabals, uh, ethnic tribalism, you know. And these things are like um, the psychotic architectonics of the unconscious that the information age is causing to suddenly emerge for the inspection of those who have <coughs> eyes to see. So we we are... Our humanness is not endangered by our machines. It's endangered by these institutional uh, entities. That, And the most spectacular and obvious example, of course, without you know, getting into the whole thing, it is corporate capitalism. Simply because corporate capitalism has the intelligence of a termite at the organismic level. And all it understands is its its agenda. And its agenda is to take cheaply extracted raw materials and fabricate them into expensive finished products which are sold to well-heeled markets in the high-tech industrial democracies. And it can't, uh, it can't uh, propagate that cycle on the closed surface of this planet much longer without the contradictions becoming uh, uh, unbearable. But it doesn't know that. You know, it has a very low-grade intelligence. So how we communicate, you know, we're all ready to switch on a dime to the new paradigm if we can just figure it out. The problem is to switch these enormous dinosaur-like institutions in which we have invested our our lives and our economies and our scientific research establishments and our you know, civil hierarchy and so forth and so on. Mm-hmm.